Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. Glad to have you with us tonight. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Now, for those of you who decided not to uh, navigate the uh, weather, <laughs> the red light went out. <laughs> it went over here. You decided not to come out and navigate the weather tonight. We understand. And so, um, glad you're able to join us online. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, we're going to jump right in here tonight. We were talking, we've been talking about confession, uh, using Proverbs 18, 21 as our foundation text, that death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Hallelujah. And so we've, we've covered, um, number one, the words of our mouth govern our lives. You know, dad Hagen, uh, said, uh, many times and in his books that, the, uh, the, we will never rise above the confession of our mouth. We will never rise above the confession of our mouth. And so the words of our life, mouth have to be right. Hallelujah. Then we said this, you must get the right words from the right place and say what God's word says. If we line up, line up, line up. anybody want to line up? Anybody ever lined up for? Okay. If we, want, if we line up with God's word, we will walk in blessing. Hallelujah. And so we spent a lot of time last week on uh, along the lines of Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success, or alternately um, deal wisely in the affairs of life. And so we, we spent time talking about keeping the word in our mouth meditating on the word, feeding on the word, having in our heart in abundance. Amen. Uh, Jesus said out of the um, abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Glory to God. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So, um, you know, whatever you put in in abundance is going to come out of your mouth. Um, I'm trying to think of a nice, quick, easy uh, thought along that line. Uh, if you put a lot of money in the bank, you, <laughs> that's what you're going to get out. <laughs> Amen? Hallelujah. So it's, it's what you put in in abundance. Uh, if you uh, feed on BattleBots all the time and you get pricked a little bit, BattleBots are going to come out. Isn't that right, Brother Bill? If you are always thinking about Raider Nation football and always talking about Raider Nation football, you get pricked a little bit, Raider Nation football is going to come out. Okay. Uh, especially when you find out that the person sitting behind you is a Kansas City Chief. You know, that's, that's, that's like, you know, uh, sacrilege to a Raider Nation person. And, and, and the Chief got it and walked out. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So uh, us Raider Nation people haven't had a lot to cheer about in a long time, you know. Oh, I remember the old Raider Chief rivalry when it was uh, Jan Stenerud and, you know, it was um, Kenny Stabler with uh, Jim Otto and, you know, Marv Hubbard in the background, back backfield and uh, Cliff Branch and Fred Bolitnikoff as the wide receivers and uh, Dave Casper as a tight end. I mean, those were the days, man. And then Atkinson, the assassin, playing cornerback to safety, you know, uh, Tatum, that, that, that was Raider football. That was... Is that before your time, though? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you hurt your dad. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, the Immaculate Reception, reception was a lie. <laughs> I watched the film the other day. It's a lie. <laughs> it was cheating. Anyway, but whatever you put in you in abundance. See, I, I was a big Raider fan. I'm, I was an Oakland A's fan, 72, 73, 74 World Series. You know, three straight titles. Last, I think it's the last team to do it, three straight. Um, I know the Yankees have done a couple. I don't know if anybody's done three since then. There's been some who've repeated, but the A's did three straight World Series, beat the Reds, the Mets, and the the Lion. I mean, uh, Tigers, in three th those three those three World Series. The big red machine. They were going to get blown out in that World Series and, and took it three to two. That's in abundance because I used to feed on that all the time. You know, Reggie, Reggie, Reggie. Okay, uh, Catfish Hunter, all those guys. Uh, Whatever you put in in abundance. And so you can always tell when you're talking to somebody what they put in in abundance. 
Now, bless Jerry's heart. I hope he's watching. He's a Dallas Cowboy fan. Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> you know, but he, he, he likes his Cowboys. And uh, is he watching? I don't know if he's watching. Uh, somebody make sure Jerry's watching. Call him, tell him. <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> They're sitting home another offseason. <laughs> he lost last week. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, now we, we are Canes fans. We like, we like uh, Carolina Hurricanes. We talk about the Carolina Hurricanes, and, and it'll come out. Okay? If you, now, let's take that to the spiritual things. If you put doubt and unbelief, um, you know, and all that in your heart all the time, that's what's going to come out. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're an Eeyore Scripture Christian, no matter. It's going to be, a, it, it's, it doesn't matter anyhow. It never was going to amount to much. And that's how you live. That's what's going to come out. But if you're a tigger, <laughs> you know, everything's pouncy, bouncy, wouncy. Okay? And, uh, you know, if you're putting word in, word will come out when you put it in in abundance. I'll, I'll never forget, um, we were at Winter Bible Seminar in, in Tulsa. Oh, gosh, this had to be late 80s, late 80s. Well, it was before they opened the, the, the um uh, Rainbow Bible Church Auditorium, which was 91, 92, something like that. So it had to be like late 80s, maybe early 90s, but I believe it was that late 80s because um, kids were real, well, I don't even know that anything was here, all right? And um, we were over in what is now, what is referred to as uh, Nanowski Recreation Center. They would use that for Rainbow Bible Church on Sundays um, because, you know, they outgrew the Rainbow Church Auditorium, not the new one, but the old one. Rooker, and it's Rooker now, Rooker Memorial. But it was a Raymond Church Auditorium uh, when I was there. And then they renamed it Rooker after, her after Sister Hagen's dad when they built the new church, uh, finally. But the Nowski Center, they could get 3,300 people in there. Um, and so they would, and it was a gym. They had built a gym for the students in the, you know, on the campus. And uh, they could seat 3,300 people. When Winter Bible would fill up. And then they would still put them over in overflow rooms around the campus on TV, you know. And um, I remember one day, because we, we were, we got there late that morning, so we were sitting near the back. And um, Brother Copeland, Brother Savelle, well, you know, the Copelands and the Savelles were both sitting near the back. And, um, you know, and then across the street was a Christian bookstore. I don't know if that's still there or not, but it was right across the street from Nanowski. And, um, you know, uh, when they kind of started, like, you know, wrapping up the service and all that stuff, uh, they got it slipped out. Well, now I hear Brother Copeland tell the story later. Okay, uh, a, a few weeks later on his broadcast, he tells a story. He goes over and he's walking around the bookstore looking at stuff. And as he's looking at stuff, uh, he sneezes. Now, you can sneeze not because you're sick. You do know that, don't you? You can get dust in your nose to make you sneeze. And um, so they walk around the bookstore and he, he, he sneezes. And the person behind the counter says, uh, you're not coming down with something, are you? Like, I wouldn't ask Brother Copeland that if... I really thought he was. My God, no. I'm the heel of the Lord. And he starts quoting scripture. And he goes all off and he's just waving his hands. He's, tell, he's telling this story, you know. And, uh, and when he finally gets done, he, cut, he, he stops and looks at the cat, person behind the cash register and they go, my God, you really believe it, don't you? <laughs> what happened? He was in abundance in his heart. And when something pricked that, it came out. You know, because he had fed on that so much. And that's what we need to do. We need to fill up with the Word of God. That's why we meditate in it day and night. If you're meditating on failure, failure is going to come out. Okay? If you're, if, you're, if you're meditating on lack, lack is going to come out. If you're meditating on sickness, sickness is going to come out. And then when, you, when somebody brings you the, what the Word says, well, I sure would like that, or I hope so. Well, we're just a hoping and a praying. That's not good enough. That's not to condemn you, but it is to locate you and make you, get you to start making adjustments. You know, what's in your heart in abundance is what will come out. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 119.97, Oh, how I love thy law. That is my meditation all the day. Amen? So we have to meditate in it and have it in our heart all the day. 
Hallelujah. So if it's in there in abundance, which, which one is it? Well, blessing and evil, it's our choice. We can say blessing and lack, you know, blessing and not enough, blessing and sickness, whatever. It's our choice because it's, it's governed by what we put in. You put in, well, you never know what God's going to do. You'll never know what God's going to do. <laughs> Hello? You won't even know if it's God or not. If you don't know, what happens then is whatever the devil sends your way, you'll think it's God. Well, you know, he's sovereign, you know. He does what he wants to do, you know. Whatever God says, uh, uh, whatever, and I hear people say, well, you know, when your number's up, your number's up. I can't find in the Bible I've got a number. My hairs are numbered. Okay? But I don't know, and I can't see in the Bible where I've got a date that is numbered for Ed Taylor to depart the earth. That's not a biblical thing. Well, how, how do you know? Well, number one, uh, uh, Hezekiah was, was told, get your house in order this day, thou shalt surely die. And then he began to pray. The prophet had to go back and give him 15 years. Hello? If you had a set time you had to leave, you wouldn't get extensions. Amen. I said amen. Okay? People who, people who do drugs and jump out windows didn't have a set time to die. They were stupid. Art Linkletter's door. Some of y'all remember who Art Linkletter is. Um, he was the one that said the kids do say the darndest things. He had the old television program. Kids say the darndest things, you know. And he, he he'd have them on the show and have them come up and they talk at the microphone and they would tell stuff on the, the family secrets and stuff. But it was cute back then. Today you wouldn't want to do that show. Amen. And if you did, you probably have Steve Harvey doing it. He'd probably be the one running it. Okay. And uh, he does some stuff on the Family Feud that you're thinking. I don't. I, I get. To see, I watch to see some of the clips. Sometimes I'm thinking, "What's he doing today?" And you go, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's Steve. <laughs> he loves the Lord, but he. I mean, he'll anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> when we don't take into account what we put in in abundance coming out, we will not speak blessing. We won't speak life. We'll speak lack. Deuteronomy chapter thirty, looking down into verse ten. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of the law, and if thou turn to the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, for this is this commandment which I commanded this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it afar off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us that we may bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. And as Paul takes and takes this into the New Testament, we said this a week ago or so, the word of faith which we preach. See, that's what Paul, Paul takes this very passage and then adds to it, it, that is, the word of faith which we preach. Okay? Now, it's not here because Paul makes it New Testament doctrine. What he's saying, what's in your mouth and in your heart, is faith, just like Jesus did. That thou may, uh, uh, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See? That I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, walk in his ways, keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and that the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. But if thy heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish, and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to Possess it. Well, we have here, uh, you know, the Old Testament passage. Now, Paul writes this, uh, uh, refers to this in, Ro in Romans 10, okay, when he says that is the word of faith which you shall preach, that if you'll keep the word in your mouth. And the word's where? It's nigh you. It's in your heart, and it's in your mouth. Now, what did Paul say to the church at Corinth? We then, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. What's he call that? The spirit of faith. See, that believing 
and speaking go hand in hand. You understand? There's, you, you can't get away from it. It is the word of faith which we preach, and then if you, the spirit of faith is we believe, therefore we speak. I mean, they, uh, I, have, I believe, therefore I speak, 2 Corinthians 4.13. We have in the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, therefore speak. So that is the spirit of faith. Well, what does the spirit of faith speak? The word of faith. The spirit of faith speaks the word of faith. Amen. And so we have here uh, a continuing process in the kingdom of God that the believer, the believer is a speaker of faith. Now, we've, we've said this before in Genesis, <coughs> where God created male, man, male and female created he, them. Glory to God. When God created man, created them male and female, the Bible says this, he formed man from the dust of the ground, he became a living soul. The Hebrew literally says this, he formed man from the dust of the ground, he became a speaking spirit. See, we speak. It is the way that things, that faith is released. It is the way that we govern our lives. Um, James says that the tongue is an unruly evil. It's hard to tame it. But it, just as the um, rudder of a ship steers a ship or bits and horses' mouths steer them, the, so is the tongue. The tongue is used to direct and to govern your life. Hello. <clears throat> Behold, the ships are so, they're so great and are driven by rough winds, are yet turned about by a very small rudder. In comparison to the size of a ship, the rudder is very small. Okay? Now, you might go down on the ground and think, man, that thing's the size of this room. But you put it down to that ship and it becomes still relatively small. Okay? Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. Your tongue may seem insignificant. The words you speak may seem not important. They're just like the rudder of a ship. They're just like a bit in the horse's mouth. They will steer. You think about it. I mean, we said this before. You take a ship, uh, take a cargo ship out. You take an oil tanker out. They're, they're huge. They're absolutely huge. Okay? You're going to sea with it. And, and you know, and of course, then they've got to leave port. They've got to go through the channel. They can't get out of the channel. Or they're going, <laughs> it's going to be big problems. Okay? So they've got to stay in the channel. But when they hit open sea, then they start setting their course to go certain directions. Okay? And, um, and they'll be up there at that helm, and they'll, they'll turn the helm. Now, they don't make a 90-degree uh, motorcycle turn. It, it don't happen that way. It, it takes time. You can start turning that wheel, and it's going to take a certain amount of time for that ship, because it's moving for the water flowing across the rudder, to start pushing that back in around as its front end is going forward to make that turn. And if you're making, if you've got to turn 90 degrees, it might take a, a mile or two, depending on the speed you're at. And, uh, and of course, if you're going, you can't really go too fast with some of that, you might <laughs> um, put some people out of their bunks into the floor. Uh, I don't know how, I don't know how fast they can turn, but it, it takes a while. And, but eventually, if you hold steady on that course, it will turn that ship in that direction because that rudder even though in comparison to that great big ship, it's a little matter back there. It's turning and it's slowly maneuvering. We think we're going to go in here one service on confession, walk out the door, I'm making my positive confession, and, the, and you're going to be a 90 degree turn like a motorcycle. You're not a motorcycle. You're a big ship. Your life, your destiny, your purposes, your, the way you're going, God's, God's plan for your life is a big ship. And there are times, it's just going to take time to turn that. Especially if you are full speed ahead on one course, to change that course, it might even be the case where you have to slow down because it's such a major course adjustment. Okay? Um, I've, I've heard of ships, you know, want, you know find out they had to return back. You know, a lot of times Navy ships, they go out and they, have, oh, they get called, oh, no, we've got to return back to base. You know? And they're going to make a complete circle. Well, they don't just go out and do a donut. They don't do a bat turn. 
They might take, I don't know how many, but three, four, five miles to make that circle all the way back around to go that other direction, go back that other direction. Okay? In our lives, when we begin to make confessions of faith, when we, as we feed on the Word of God, if we've been going this way, why did I mean, you know, uh, warp nine in a ship? Y'all watch Star Trek? <laughs> you watch Star Trek? Don't watch Star Trek. Come out. <laughs> we understand warp speed. Yeah, warp speed is the bending of light and, and going traveling at the speed of light, but bent so it's even faster than light speed. Okay. In Star Wars, hyper, hyper, hyperspace or whatever. Hyper, hi, the hyperdrive, you're going to jump into hyperspace. Or, yeah. All right. If you're going wide, if you're, if you're running four, 25 knots straight ahead with a cargo ship that weighs, you know, 300,000 tons, got oil in it or something, you're not going to turn that on a dime. And if your life has been running one way real quick, and you come in, you hear us teach, that's, that's right, Pastor. That's a good word on confession. That's a good word on speaking and speaking and speaking. You're not turning it around on a dime. You're not doing a bat turn. You're not going to run down here, hit the brakes, turn the wheel, spin around, and then hit the gas, and you're going back the other direction. It, it takes time for you to see the results of the rudder turning. That rudder's turned. It's been changed in a direction that will bring about a course change, but you don't see it immediately. Now, what do you, what, why, you know, can you imagine the helmsman going, well, I turned to 90 degrees, nothing happened, and he turned back the other way. What's going to happen? Nothing. He's going to end up going back the other way. Right? We can't do that with the spiritual things. We can't go. I'm, I'm, try, I'm, I'm doing that confession thing, man, and I've been on it for two days. And I hadn't seen anything yet. Forget it. Go right back. And, and take the rudder and put it back on the, guess what? You're not going to see anything. You can't base how quickly you see change to determine whether or not change is taking place. Because the Word of God tells us that the tongue is like the rudder of a ship. Okay? That's going to be, it's going to take time to turn it. It's going to take time for you to, actually, let me change that. It's going to take time for you to see the results of the turn. Okay? Not necessarily, uh, it's not because it hasn't, it's not that it didn't turn. You turn the rudder, but it's going to take time for you to see the results, the effect of that turned rudder. It's going to take time to see the effects of you changing your confession. Okay? Cause, because if you've been going one way with it and you're barreling along that way, now you're going to start changing. And you're changing what you're saying. And if you're expecting a hungry jack instant potato results, it ain't happening. Okay, and let's face it, Hunger Jack ain't nearly as good as peeling the potatoes, boiling them, mashing them up, putting a bunch of butter and salt and, and, and heavy whipping cream in there. It ain't the same, okay? I mean, it's not even in the same neighborhood. Are y'all here you go home? All right. So that brings us to this. If you, are, you have gotten the right words from the right place, and you're starting to say the right things out of the abundance of your heart, you've got to hold fast your confession. You guys, you got to, I think this is a naval term, steady up. You know, you don't know. You're a swab. You're a swab. You're supposed to know. Let me ask the army guy, the grunt. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I think, I think, they were, uh, I think they actually told him to steady up at the helm or whatever, you know, go Oh, that's right. He was on the base, landing airplanes. Yeah, he would never been at the helm. It's probably a good thing for all the people on the on the uh, vessel, right? Okay. Um, you know, steady up on five degrees or whatever. You know. Um, now we got Jerry out here, the Air Force guy. We got Joe the grunt, and we got Cap the grunt. I mean, the swabby. Now his dad's a grunt. Yeah. Yeah. So is everybody else, you're the only swabby. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> that helmsman has to stay steady on his course. Hello? And he has to trust 
the instruments he has. When he goes, when he turns that helm and it reads a 90 degree change, so maybe he's at 270 and he, he, he steers to 360, that's a 90 degree change. And he's looking at that instrument, but out there he's not seeing anything happen yet. He's got to be steady. He can't waver. He's got orders to, to turn to 360 degrees. He has to follow that order. Well, Cap, it don't look like we're doing it. Would you like to be a uh, ensign? <laughs> uh, hello? I, I don't, Master Sergeant, what are the different ranks in the Navy? Ensign, Petty Officer, this is Equivalent Sergeant. Um, what, what's a lieutenant? A lieutenant? A corporal? Petty Officer. What's a sergeant? First class, a petty officer. Second class. second class petty officer. Okay. He might be petty officer at the helm, and, and, when, and when he, if he lets go of that helm and starts going a different direction, uh, he might hear the, the, the uh, admiral say, uh, Ensign, <laughs> <laughs> report below. <laughs> I, I got this. Okay. <clears throat> no. You can't let the things you're seeing affect the fact that you've turned it, and it says not 306 degrees, you're turning to 360 degrees. You can't let the circumstances around you override the instruments. What's our instrument? The Word of God. It's our guide. It's our directive. It's, we have to trust that what the Word says is the course we're on. Amen? And we can't let go of that. We've got we to gotta stay steady on that. Yeah, but the circumstances, that you can't help that. Okay? Pilots can't trust their eyes. They have to look at that instrument because their eyes can lie to them. They, they can get um, uh, disoriented on the horizon. They can get disoriented by what they see. <clears throat> and they have to trust that instrumentation panel. And you can get disoriented spiritually if you begin to trust what you see more than your instrument panel of the Word of God. Amen? But if you'll, if you'll trust those instruments and trust that they're right and they're accurate and they're correct, even when you visually are disoriented, you can navigate through that and come out victorious on the other side. Get where you need to be. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay. So we have to hold fast. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a, a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. That same word is translated confession. And many translations say the confession here. Hold fast our confession. Hebrews 10.23 says this, Let us hold fast the profession or confession of our faith <coughs> without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Now, let's think about it. Let's use that example again. The instruments say, you've turned to 360 degrees. Those instruments are, and, and, you know, you understand that they're regularly checked out. Okay? They come in and check them out, make sure that they're accurate, make sure that they're not off, make sure there's no anomalies going on. They're accurate. Okay? Well, the Bible says, we can hold fast our profession or confession of faith because he's faithful that promised. It's true. It's steady. It's steadfast. It's unshakable. The Word of God doesn't change. It's accurate all the time. Okay? So in your life, you have to hold fast that profession of faith. When you look into the Word of God and it says, by his stripes ye were healed. You can't look at that and go, well, uh, in the name of Jesus, I believe that I received the healing and wake up the next day, oh, my God, I'm going to die. You're not, you're, you, let the, you let the circumstances, what you could see, your senses disorient you in relation to the instruments that say you are on, you are on task, you are on point. The Word of God says, yes, you are healed. The Word of God says, by his stripes you were healed. Now, the Word of God says that it's one of your benefits. 
Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities? Who healeth all thy diseases? So we're going to steady up on the word of God. And we're going to, we, we, just, we got to tell our senses that that disorientation that you see out there doesn't supersede the navigational truth of that instrument panel. It doesn't supersede the navigational truth of the Word of God. you got to put your confidence in what the Word says and then hold fast to that, not relinquish that, not let go of that, and don't let anything you see different sway you into believing that that's not so. Y'all hear you gone home. Okay, I got a one amen that somebody is here. Daniel, I'm glad you're here. Now, hold fast comes from a word, kratio. <clears throat> and it means to cause a state to continue. You know what I mean by state? A state of being, a state of existence, a state of a situation. To cause a state to continue on the basis of some authority or power. That means to hold, to keep, to cause, to continue. So we are told to hold fast. We're told to allow this state to continue. Now, remember, we said this. If that helmsman turns to 360 from a 270, that's a 90-degree turn, and in there somewhere he decides to let the helm go because it ain't going the way he thinks it should because nothing he sees is, is showing him that it's happening the way he thought it would. What's going to happen? That rudder is going to correct or move back to the straight position. Why? Because the natural flow of water is going to straighten it out and not keep it turning. Okay? So if you let go up, if you don't keep the helm turned, if you don't keep it engaged and locked in that position, it will revert back to a straight course. So you might have made uh, 285 degrees. I mean, from 270, or 270 to, yeah, that's not, that's, uh, <laughs> that's 75 degrees short. Now, you're on, you may, you're going to put you on some different track, but it ain't going to be on the track you're looking for. If we let the circumstances of life come in and call us, cause us not to hold fast to that state of believing what the Word of God says, we're not going to stay on course. We have to trust that the Word is true. Amen? Um, <clears throat> hold, down, hold down fast, hold for, fast, hold forth, uh, held, holding, to be, um, uh, to be strong, mighty, to prevail. Um, it means to lay, lay or take hold of. Hallelujah. Uh, hold fast. Glory to God. And, and that's from Vines Expository Dictionary, New Testament words. All right? So you got to hold fast. If we can learn to trust the Word of God, to speak what the Word of God says, to move in that direction, now we have an example of that in the New Testament. There was a certain woman. Now Jesus didn't say, I'm going to make up a story. He said there was a certain woman, okay, which had an issue of blood 12 years, suffered many, well actually he didn't say this, this, this is telling what happened. Uh, he suffered, she suffered many things of many physicians and spent all that she had was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, if I may but touch his garment or his clothes, I shall be whole. She said. Now, uh, the Amplified says this, the Amplified Classic. We have to call it, we have to call it the Amplified Classic now because the new one is a joke. It's not an Amplified Bible anymore. I don't know why they call it Amplified. They've, they've, they've de-amplified the Amplified. You know, they turned it down. So now the, the original is called the Amplified Classic, just in case you're wondering. So but this is from the Amplified Classic, okay? It says in verse 28, for she kept saying, if I may touch his garments, I shall be restored to health. Now, the Greek, the Greek construct there, now you, you understand that the Greek language we have our Bible is a translation, and the King James in particular <coughs> was a word-for-word -word translation. They didn't embellish. 
In other words, even if the tense of the verb or whatever required three words to say it, they found one word that would say it. It didn't always come in there spot on. It, it would leave something out. Agape. Love. Well, love can mean a whole lot of things. Now, what a lot of people call agape, when they say love, they, they're thinking eros or phileo or storge. Okay? All of them are different types of love. Uh, th that's for the Greek words. I think there's a fifth one. We don't use it in the Bible. But agape is unconditional love. And when uh, the Bible says that, um, you know, for love or charity in 1 Corinthians 13, that's agape. Okay? They used charity because at the time the King James was translated to be charitable was unconditional because the rich ruling class saw the others as peons and they were better than them. And so they would, to be charitable to them, would be an unconditional love. They could, they could benefit them in no way. There was no benefit by giving to the pauper, who tenant farmer, who had nothing. To do something good for them and do something loving for them, there was no benefit in for them. So that was charitable, that was charity, that was unconditional love. <coughs> However, in our language today, just to say love is, love is, and then go on and give all the definitions there in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, doesn't convey any of the meaning without adding to it unconditional. Okay? And so we have that, uh, we also have that in verbs, in, in, word, in verb action saying, uh, words. Here, the, the uh, tense of the verb, and you've got, you got tenses, you've got voice, you've got mood, you've got uh, uh, person, you've got all this stuff that all plays into it, okay? And what gender is it? You know, is it, uh, is it present, past, you know, uh, future, present, future, I mean, all this stuff. Greek's got a bunch of stuff, more than English. This particular one, um, and I don't know if it's A-R-T, so I don't remember what the actual, um, whatever it is, but it's in a continual sense. In other words, it wasn't she said one time. Okay? As the Amplified says, she kept saying. But she said and kept on saying. She said and kept on saying. Why? Because she is holding fast to what she believes. That if I may touch his garment, I shall be whole. Now remember, she's a woman with an issue of blood. She suffered many things and many physicians, was nothing better, but rather grew worse. And she had been in that state for a long time, suffered for about 12 years. Okay? For her to go out in public was a death sentence and come in contact with people. She had a communicable disease. She was worthy of stoning. What she was to do is she was out in public and someone came, she was to cry out, unclean, unclean, so they could move away from her. That was the requirements. Else she could be stoned. But the Bible says she came in the press. She was in bed, nothing better, rather growing worse, heard about Jesus, got up out of that bed because she was saying, kept on saying, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. She gets to the press instead of hollering out unclean. She's saying, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. And, you know, if anybody recognized her, they could have stoned her. But she was saying, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. And if I can touch him, I'll be whole. Now, we, I, I believe we know from this, she touched the hem of his garment. Okay? Um, that proud was so thick, she had to get down and crawl in to get to Jesus. Brushes the garment, and Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue went out of him, Said, who touched me? And then the uh, top-notch disciples. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? Now, let me give you a modern, little modern twist on this. <laughs> when Jesus says, who touched me? They're probably looking at each other going, did he get any sleep last night? I don't know. Well, I don't think he slept the last three or four nights. Who's going to say something? I don't know. You want to say something? Jesus. Everybody's touching you. It's a throng. It's a crowd. So thick. It's, it's, it's uh, so thick you can't even stir them with a stick, is that old saying is. They couldn't. She can't. But what's she doing? She's not letting that stop her. 
She's not letting the sentence of death stop her. She's saying and kept on saying, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. Hits the garment. Power goes out. Jesus is going, who touched me? Why? He knew in himself that virtue had gone out of him. Now, how did he know the difference between her touch and their touch? Because faith is a different touch. Faith makes a demand. You had the curiosity seekers. You probably had the groupies who wanted to be a groupie, a Jesus groupie, you know, because he was popular. It's amazing how popularity would draw people, even the ugly folks. Now, according to the Bible, Jesus wasn't handsome. There was no comeliness. Um, there was no form, no comeliness that we should desire him. He would not have been on the cover of GQ magazine. Are you saying Jesus was ugly? No, but the Bible sure doesn't say he was good looking. How many of you ever saw the preacher's wife, you know, with Whitney Houston and Denzel Washington? You know, mama's in town, and she said, hm, that's what I call good looking. You know, <laughs> that wasn't Jesus. Isaiah 52, and then it says, there was no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. He wasn't GQ. He wasn't Mr. Uh, Metro. He wasn't man bun with the skinny jeans and a tunic top. Hello? I mean, honestly, he wore rabbinical clothing, traditional rabbi, teacher clothing. How do you know? They called him, they called him uh, Mary came and said, called him Rabboni, ra rabbi. Okay? That's the kind of clothes he wore. He wasn't wearing, he wasn't wearing the modern, cool, hip, you know, whatever they wore. What, uh, robe. Yeah. All right? Yet he, they were touching him and nothing was happening. And this one woman presses through that crowd because she was holding fast. She, did, she didn't get to there and let go of the wheel of, of the helm and go, oh, there's too many people over there. I can't get through. Oh, I thought this would be my day. You know, go all Eeyore on the whole thing. Okay? No. If that's all right, get down and crawl in. I came from a miracle. Because if I can touch him, I'll be whole. And if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. Now, Jesus said, who touched me? The disciples do the pull their stunt. I mean, that's a, you got to think, Jesus had to have had some sarcastic looks. Hey, you just gotta, you gotta think. He had to at least once or twice roll his eyes. Maybe he did the head slap. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. And um, who touched me? And he turned about to see her that had done this thing. And she, fearing and trembling, came down and told him all the truth. Okay. Now I think I skipped over something. She knew immediately that she was healed of that. Okay? Virtue went out of him, but she knew that she was healed. Okay? Um, he knew virtue went out of him. Did it say she knew about her own body that uh, she knew she was healed? Okay. Straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And then Jesus, immediately knowing that virtue went out of him, said, who touched me? And the disciples come up with their bozo answer. And then he just, he, he's like, okay, guys, forget it. Just forget it. I'm going to take care of this. And he looks around and says, they've done this thing. And she comes fearing and trembling and tells him the whole truth. And she says, woman, uh, great is thy faith. Amen. Go ahead, go to the next one. Let me quote it properly. Thou, thou, woman, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of the plague. Okay. And she didn't get hold of the plague after he said, Behold the plague. She'd already gotten healed of the plague that was plaguing her body. All right? Say, Hold, you, you're healed. Take it, keep it. Now, you had to know people at that point went, That's the woman with the issue of blood. <laughs> but she just got healed. Why did she get healed? Because she would not let go of her faith. She held fast to that profession of faith. Can you say, Amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Um, and we're going to finish right there. Amen. So she held fast to her faith. He touched her. When she touched him. Little David Ingalls there. <laughs> Amen. The power flowed out of him when she held fast. You're, you're, 
your course will be established when you hold fast. She could have it at any time on the way to Jesus got caught up with the circumstances. I'm tired. It's been 12 years walking around, you know, with a, with a, a constantly bleeding. Okay. Are you here? Anemic. Had to be anemic. And um, encountering people. Trying to get to Jesus because she knows the, the tumult somewhere in town. She's trying to get over there. And when she gets there, there's every people everywhere. There's a throng. But she would not be denied. And she would not change course. She was trusting what she believed. And she was saying it. And so she got healed of that plague. In Jesus' name. Amen? Hallelujah. Y'all get anything out of that? That's good stuff. All right. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Uh, it's time to give. Wednesday night offering. Need an offering envelope. We, we do now have offering envelopes. Uh, somebody made some this weekend. I won't say who. <laughs> me. <laughs> Joe been looking at me for months. Need some offering envelopes, Pastor. Need some offering envelopes. And uh, <clears throat> I couldn't get to the printer, so I just made them. Hallelujah. Which was a good thing because we modified the design. Hallelujah. If I, hadn't, if I hadn't waited, it was a good thing I waited, Joe. See, I modified the design. That's why I was waiting. I just knew, didn't know that. <laughs> yep. I was going to start printing. I thought, let me see if I can change that. Yeah, it took about 15 minutes of playing around and re, 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 uh, uh, redoing the layout and got them on there. And so... Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, Jesus said to give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over men will give unto your bosom. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you're giving electronically, go ahead, get your offering ready, and send it electronically. Uh, glory to God. Amen. Now, Father, we pray over the offering. We thank you, the people, the blessed. We thank you, your windows of heaven are open unto them, and you empty out blessings they don't have room enough to receive. We declare that we're delights on land. We lend to many and don't borrow. That we walk in the land of the living. We walk in full supply and overflow. And hallelujah, we are blessing. We bless others. We, we are called to be a blessing, and we bless others. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Joe, take in-house. Hallelujah. Electronically, go ahead and send that. Glory to God. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We appreciate you being with us. And um, I want you to remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. That whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Good night.